Assume again that you have a signal x of t. This signal x of t is a signal that represents the solution to a differential equation, or is a signal that represents the output of a given system, such as the position of a mass spring damper system, the current or the charge in electrical signal. Because this comes from a differential equation, we know that x of t can be composed of two main elements. x of t can be a function of exponential waveforms, can be a function of sinusoidal waveforms, or can be a combination of them. Sigma is a real number. Exponential of negative sigma times t gives a exponential waveform. Exponential of negative j omega t, where j is a complex variable, gives a sinusoidal waveform of frequency omega. If you now take this signal, we can go from exponential waveforms only, when, for instance, omega is zero and sigma is smaller than zero, or the other way around if sigma is less than zero, to a sinusoidal waveform, where now sigma is zero and omega is different than zero, to now combinations of them, such as this one, a combination of a sinusoidal and an exponential waveform. There is a sinusoidal that decays over time. In this case, sigma and omega are both different than zero. The question is, what is sigma, what is omega, that we need to create x of t? Now, to do that, we need to create some signals and compare those signals with x of t. Let's call those signals that we create by using random combinations of sigma and omega a probing signal. To create a probing signal, let's pick a random point on this plane. We have here omega, the frequency, and sigma, the exponential component. Let's pick this point. If you pick this point, you're specifying sigma and you're specifying omega. Let's call this point A. So we have sigma A and omega A. With that, we can create a signal YA that is given by exponential of negative sigma a plus j omega a times t. This is the signal that we created. It could have any shape. Now we need to compare y a with x. How do we do that? That's where that integral comes in. If you now multiply these two signals, x of t and y a of t, and take the integral from negative infinity to infinity dt, this is a way to calculate how close these two signals are. Let's call the solution here to this expression. Let's call that x of s. Now let's take our, our signal x of t that I'm going to try to redraw here. This is x of t. And let's take our signal ya. And let's assume that our guess here of picking point a to recreate x was wrong. So the signal that you're going to have is off, is not necessarily x of t. It's going to be something like that. This is ya of t. And let's draw around here the axis for time. And this axis here is the magnitude. What do you do now? Now you multiply these two expressions. You see that up to this part here, we have a positive number. Now x and y have different signs. This becomes a negative number. Here x and y are positive, are both negative. So you have a positive number again, and so on. And now we take the integral. Taking the integral means taking this area, adding to this negative area, adding to this one, and so on. The result here will be a finite number because y and x are not necessarily matching. The result is a finite number that has no interest in the Laplace transform. 
We can now give this plane here a third dimension. Let's call this x of s. And let's take the result that you got from this integration and plot that point. And that point here will be the x a. And now let's take this point A and make this point A travel all over the S plane by taking all values of omega and sigma. This is accounted for in one step when you do the Laplace transform. Now let's go back here and pick another point. Let's A move to this location here. Let's call that point B. And by picking point B, we are specifying sigma, sigma B, and you're picking a omega, omega B. Now let's assume that this is the exact combination that we need in order to recreate x of t when you take omega b and sigma b and put it in here in our definition for y, uh, yb in this case. yb is exactly x of t, is the same shape. Now let's draw the axis here. This is time and this is the magnitude. Now they have these two signals, we can do the integral, multiply them and do the integral. Because the signals are the same, this is the same as taking the integral of x squared or yb squared. x squared or yb squared will always be positive. When you now take the integral, you see that you are taking the integral of a very large positive area. And the result cannot be larger than this one. The result now, because yb and x match, this will be the maximum value of this integration. Now let's go back here and plot the value. This value now will tend to infinity, though it will be a bounded number. So around B, we'll see that our function now will be tending to infinity. And because complex numbers always have a conjugate, we have another one here with negative omega. Now, when we approach either of these points, our function tends to infinity. And if you now plot all points for all possible combinations of omega and sigma, we can see trends like this. Or this is the peak for B. At this peaks here, this means that at that specific combination of sigma and omega, we are approaching x of t. At all other points, the function will have lower values that have no particular interest in the Laplace transform. Another specific point that you need to pay close attention to is when this function tends to zero. There are specific combinations of sigma and omega that will lead to a zero in this integration. Let's think about, for instance, when x of t is a sinusoidal or an exponentially decay waveform, such as that one, and now when we assign omega equals to zero and sigma equals to zero, y of t is simply one. If you now take the integral of this expression, which is x of t, again, our new x of t, take this, multiply by one, and take the integral, it's simply this area minus this area plus that area and so on, and this gives zero. When this is zero, we'll also see zero there. So at zero, the function should tend to zero. Now that we have this representation, we can go back and try to find a equivalent S function that it displays the same behavior. Now let's assume that after we did that calculation, we got a graph like this one. We have two peaks and one zero. These peaks, we are going to call them poles, and the zeros, we are going to call them zeros. Let's assume that these peaks are occurring at a value of omega, sigma equals to b and a value of omega equals to aj and negative aj. And let's assume that the zero is occurring at zero. Now we can take this 3D plot and convert that into a 2D plot with the location of these special points. So here we have the two poles and here we have the zeros. Our function x of s was defined as the integral from negative infinity to infinity 
of x of t exponential of a negative st dt. Exponential of negative st is what we use, again, to, to create the probing signals, compare that with x of t through the integration. The result of that integration are points on this three-dimensional plane. Those points are the highest at these two peaks at the poles, and those points and the result of x of s goes to zero at that specific point, when s tends to zero. Now, if you want to see what the function x of s is, we need to create a function of s that will display the same behavior as we see here. Let's start with points where the function goes to zero. In this case, the function goes to zero when s tends to zero. How do we make our function now a function of s that it goes to zero when the function tends to zero? Oh, let's just multiply that by s. So now when s goes to zero, x of s goes to zero. And we are here and here. Hypothetically, if that point was s sigma equals to negative 5, for instance, it would be here, then we would write s plus 5. So when s tends to negative 5, the function goes to 0. So this would be s plus 0 or minus 0. Let's look at this point. At this point, s equals to negative b. Right, this is the negative axis. Here, negative b, just to avoid confusion, negative b, plus aj. This is aj. Now, when s approaches negative b plus aj, we need our function to go to, to infinity. If you want this to go to infinity, we can now divide this by s plus b minus aj, or s minus this s plus b minus aj. Now when s approaches this point, this tends to 0, and x of s is s divided by something tending to 0, goes to infinity. What about this point? This point we also need to account for. At that point, s equals to negative b minus aj. Now, to make this function go to infinity when s approaches negative b minus aj, do s minus minus b minus aj. So you have here s plus b plus aj. Interesting. Now this function displays the same behavior as this function here. And this function is the Laplace transform of x of t. Now, the way we approach this is not the traditional way we see in the textbooks. We went from having a signal to now decomposing that signal into this 3D representation here on the S plane with the magnitude of the, this transformation to having the Laplace function that represents that signal. But in reality, what are going to happen is that we have a model. The model will give us a differential equation. From the differential equation, we'll get here, once you take the Laplace transform of that differential equation, and from here, we'll go back there to create x of t. And this operation here, from going from the s function to the temporal response, is the inverse Laplace transformation of the function we obtained.